Hi everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to biology class. Today we're going to take a look at human genetics. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Remember these slides are available for your use in your learning management system, whether that is Schoology or it is uh, Canvas. Um, your slides are available there. Human genetics. Now, when I was at UCLA, I took a whole entire course on human genetics today. Of course, we're not going to cover everything in that course, but we'll take a look at some interesting topics. Before we do that, we're going to um, review some basic terms that we know from our studies of mitosis and meiosis and genetics. So, Let's go ahead and take a look at these four sets of terms. We have a gene and an allele. A gene, as you know, is a DNA sequence that codes for a protein product. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you take a look at this chromosome, remember this is a duplicated chromosome with two chromatids. And that the gene is represented right here. It says it's a segment of DNA that codes for a trait. It doesn't necessarily have a band on it, but that's what it's showing in this picture here. Sometimes there's a band and the gene is actually just below or just above it. And we can use the, the, uh, the band for reference. An allele is a different form of the same gene. You can see I have some, some different eye colors there, but these eye colors are due to the same gene. You might just have different copies of different alleles those are different forms of the same, very same gene. There are maybe different alleles in the population. So that is how you get uh, uh, all kinds of different colors in individual people. All right, I'll remind you of the term homologous chromosomes or homologs. And homologous chromosomes are the chromosomes that bear the two alleles for each characteristic. They are the chromosome pair. Okay, when we say that, you have uh, 46 chromosomes and 23 pairs. Let's say you took chromosome number five. Chromosome number five, would, you have two copies of them. And this would be two homologs or two homologous chromosomes of that chromosome five. On that chromosome, you have the same genes. And you might have the same allele at the same physical location or locus like you have here. This is a homozygous dominant for this gene. This is homozygous recessive for this gene because you have two copies of this gene, of this gene one on each homolog, but it's a recessive form. Now in this case, this is where you have a heterozygote that has one of each of the two different types of alleles. One is dominant and one is recessive. Now the term autosomal, it, uh, it's for the first 22 chromosomes. Chromosomes 1 to 22 are the same um, in males and females. And so you can take a look at the karyotypes that are in this picture right here. And you can see that the only difference between uh, the two karyotypes is that 23rd chromosome here. And if you take a look at the 23rd chromosome, those are called the sex chromosomes. If you have a Y, you're a male. So this is the 23rd chromosomes for male. This is the uh, homologs of the 23rd chromosomes for female. This is XX, this is XY. And Y is much smaller. The Y chromosome has gene for develop, development of the testes. So um, if you have the Y, the testes develop, you're a male. If you don't have the Y, then the testes don't develop and the ovaries are allowed to develop because they're not getting that input from the, from the genes uh, that uh, the code for a protein that is the signal for the development of the testes. All righty, I'll remind you as we uh, studied meiosis, we learned about crossing over and different ways of producing new combinations of alleles to increase genetic variability. One way of, of increasing genetic variability is by increasing the percentage of genetic recombination. You can see here what's happening. These, these two homologs get so close together that they form right there, chiasma, and this tetrad formation with four 
different chromatids, they're so close together, they swap information. So that's when you get novel mixtures <clears throat> of the genetic material. This increases genetic variability. This is called genetic recombination. But it's one of many ways that genetic variability is increased in our body. For example, uh, last time we went over the, uh, the idea that, that out of five million sperm, only one of them wins. And so that unique combination of genes is represented in the, in the offspring. Uh, remember, it does depend on where the chromosomes line up um, during metaphase of meiosis. That um, seemingly random event actually has different outcomes depending on where that uh, where that chromosome lines up during metaphase in the equatorial plate. Uh, we know that uh, some some genes have uh, different alleles, and you may have you may carry different alleles on the on the same homologous chromosomes. And so you can have a, you could be homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. So these are all ways to increase genetic variability. And crossing over is a way to increase genetic variability in, um, in humans. And then the other term that we want to review with you is the karyotype. Um, uh, new technologies can provide insight into one's genetic legacy and reproductive decisions an increasing number of genetic disorders, tests are available that can distinguish carriers of genetic disorders. And so uh, here's the karyotype, and you can see the, the photograph of your, um, <clears throat> of your chromosomes, and you can see that they've been matched up so that you can see that they're the correct number of chromosome pairs. Uh, the fetus that gave up this uh, karyotype is also a male because you can see there's the XY for the for the 23rd chromosome for the sex chromosomes. Now the karyotype is, uh, it's come to us because the uh, fetal skin cells that are in the amniotic fluid uh, are used and, and grown, and then we can examine them. Um, we get this through amniocentesis, but we can also get it through CVS, that's chorionic villus sampling, which is a, a um, much uh, less, uh, intrusive uh, procedure. As you can see in the picture here, you have uh, for an amnio, what you need is you need to do a sonogram so that you can stick a large needle into the uh, amniotic fluid and withdraw some of the fluid that way. You should be able to get some of the cells the same way as you go this way, and you can do it at a much earlier stage. Um, get those fetal cells right there from the uh, from the villus, um, and so um, uh, that's actually plural as a villi. So you can uh, extract tissue from the from the villi. There's a little finger-like structures in the chorion, and then grow those, and in several hours you can get a karyotype. So there's a young lady who is uh, man. That is an old machine, but look at the results. I remember when my niece was born, um, her mother, my, my sister-in-law sent out um, baby's first pictures, and this is what she sent out. So that is, the, uh, that is what you get when you do an ultrasound and get a picture of the fetus that way. It um, used to be that a technician would print this out on paper and then use scissors and cut them out and paste them. They could do it pretty rapidly. Within five minutes, you would have a, a karyotype. That's old school though. Now you, you just put that on a computer screen, add color to it, bam, you can match that up pretty quickly. Um, I'm told it takes less than a minute to do that stuff. Um, there's more information about, about karyotypes. Um, should you be interested, especially those of you who are allied health majors? Okay. Um, as far as screening goes, this is an old picture from 2004 of the uh, newborn screenings available by state. California was actually pretty low. And so uh, uh, it used to be that you would prick the baby's heel, take a blood sample, and put that on this card. And then um, there are chemicals already in the card, and then you could. Uh, they would, you would get an instant uh, result. 
to check for the uh, existence of different uh, different medical conditions. But um, as we'll see a little bit later in a different talk, um, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do that something. Um, there are all kinds of just different ethical issues that, that come about. Um, how about this one? Do you terminate a pregnancy if your baby has a birth defect? Um, hmm, that's a tough question. Uh, I know for many of you the answer is no, but I have a friend who did this very thing. Her marriage was in trouble. She found out she was pregnant. Um, she was over 40. It was, the child was going to have Down syndrome, so they decided not to have their baby. I don't know if I would be able to do that, but that's my own choice. And so, um, so that is uh, that's something to, to look out for. All right. Um, the main part of this talk has to do with uh, gene locations on the same chromosome. Um, it's called a linkage group. All the genes located on a given chromosome um, are inherited together. So that's why we call it a linkage group. Wherever gene P goes, gene L will go. Why? They're on the same chromosome. So they're on the same chromosome. They're going to uh, be inherited together. All right, uh, here's some sex-linked traits. Uh, this is hemophilia. Here's a picture of a person with hemophilia. Hemophilia is a, a, uh, a disorder that has been studied for hundreds of years because it was, it was seen in the royal families of England. And in the royal families of England, uh, what you would have is people who would uh, marry each other because they were both royalty. Or if, uh, if the kingdom of, of Vallejo uh, was at war with the, the kingdom of, uh, of the Granny Smiths, then I would offer my daughter and he, they would offer the son and they would, they would have a, a, a marriage between the royal families and that would um, create peace between those, those two uh, families, those two kingdoms. So because of that, we know a lot of uh, the history behind the, the, uh, the marriage lines. And so we could study hemophilia as it went through the royal families. Um, hemophilia disease, if you, uh, used to be if you got a cut, you would uh, bleed out and bleed to death. Um, there are now chemicals, uh, medications, stuff to help people who have that. But it's still a, certainly a different lifestyle. Um, Red-green colorblindness is also a sex link trait. Remember, a sex link trait is a trait that does not necessarily have to do with, it, it, the, the name implies that it has to do with the 23rd chromosome. Okay, so what it is is that a, a woman has XX and the gene is on the X chromosome, but a male has XY and the Y has virtually nothing on it much smaller and it has fewer genes. So the Y doesn't have the gene that the X has. So it's more likely that a male has a disorder because the male doesn't have another chromosome with a different dominant genotype that's going to wipe out the disease causing um, allele. So um, if, you, if you can see the number 16, Right here, what you have is uh, uh, is normal vision, normal color vision. But if you can see a different number, I don't even know what it is for this one, then you might have red green color blindness. Um, <clears throat> some people, instead of seeing red and green, they see various shades of gray when it comes to red and green. Um, so that is a characteristic that has to do with the uh, with the uh, sex link traits. And then male pattern baldness, we'll get into a little bit later, but uh, we'll see that if you're male and your grandpa on your mom's side is bald, then there's a, there's a really good chance that you're going to be bald too. 
All right, in order to do well on the common quiz, um, you need to know that Morgan worked with fruit flies, the fruit fly named Drosophila, in order to do any mapping. Um, mapping is, uh, is the process where if you take a look at genes on a chromosome, you can see how far they are apart relative to each other. So over here, here's some, um, here's three different hypothetical genes, genes G, C, and L. You can figure out uh, how close they are together right here um, by measuring the amount of recombination crossing over between those genes. We do that experimentally. We have these numbers here, this data. From this data, you can reason out that um, G and L have much more crossing over, so they're far apart because there's more distance uh, for the genes uh, to have crossing over events occur between them. But if two genes are close together, like G and C here, uh, they're closer together, it's going to be fewer crossing over events. Similarly, C and L are going to have fewer crossing over events, but between G and L, you might have twice as many, and so that's how we know that C is between. G and L. So um, this certainly could be instead LCG because they're relative to each other. And so uh, when we figure that out, that's how we, that's how we do that. All right, to, uh, to finish up today's talk, we're gonna take a look at some uh, processes that happen. Uh, we have uh, in humans, uh, we, we're gonna see, uh, take a look at Tay-Sachs, a contratoric plastic dwarfism, male pattern baldness, and some, uh, some disorders of the uh, uh, chromosome numbers in the sex chromosomes. Now you can figure out many things from a family tree or a pedigree. And when we do a pedigree, we typically try to figure out not these types of characteristics, which are fun to look at, and you'll do that in the lab this week. But um, more importantly, you can take a look at how, how uh, diseases are inherited. And you can see in this one here, this is, this is a pedigree of a family that has deafness running through it. And so Jonathan Lambert is deaf. And he got that from, uh, looks like he got a big D from, uh, must be, oh, and he got a little D from each, his mother and his father. And that's why he used little D, little D, which showed the recessive deafness trait. And since his wife was heterozygous, who was not deaf, but she was a carrier for that deafness, um, statistically half of their kids should have had uh, deafness and two out of seven did. So that's how you read that. Uh, many inherited disorders in humans are controlled by a single gene. That's not true for other things like intelligence, like, like hair and eye color. Their multiple genes are the multigenic or polygenic traits. But um, some of the uh, disorders are single gene disorders, and you can see in this list some that you might recognize cystic fibrosis, uh, sickle cell anemia, Tay Sachs disease. Those are recessive disorders. Um, here's a dominant one we're going to see in just a moment it's a contraplagic dwarfism. And uh, I have this one, hypercholesteremia. So most human genetic disorders are recessive, so you only have a one out of four chance if both parents are carriers. But that's what happens here in Tay-Sachs. If you have two people who are carriers, they can have a baby who will have a limited lifespan. And so um, a lot of text on the slide, but basically what happens is uh, there are some, uh, some chemicals that build up in the brain, and then the nerve cells uh, get surrounded by, by some fatty tissue, which causes neurological problems. Um, very rare disease, but more likely in the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish uh, population of Eastern Europe. So you have two people who have that background, and you should get tested. Um, even if you get tested, uh, and you are both carriers, you still have only a one out of four chance of having a baby who has um, Tay-Sachs, but then you'll have the information to know whether you should um, <clears throat> just avoid having a baby. Uh, maybe you can adopt a baby. 
maybe you have the baby anyway, knowing that there's a 75% chance that there will not be a problem. <clears throat> uh, when I was a student at UCLA, I was tested for Tay-Sachs. Um, I was walking up Bruin Walk, and the uh, Jewish Student Union uh, had, a, had a table, and they, uh, some of their members said, hey, you want to get tested for Tay-Sachs? And I said, yes. That's a freshman. I didn't know what that was. So I got tested for JSEC. Turns out I'm not a carrier. So even though, uh, even if my wife were a carrier, she's not. Um, and uh, we would have no chance of having a baby with JSEC. All right. Um, here's some of my friends who are uh, uh, shorter than I am. They are little people. Don't call them dwarfs. I don't like that. They're called little people. And so my friend Evan and Michelle was actually in my college class uh, as a student. Um, my friend Marilyn uh, is the matriarch to the family. And then uh, Dan uh, is uh, my friend who works at, a, he's a manager at a local grocery store. They have an older son whose name is Clint, uh, who has a short girlfriend, not a dwarf girlfriend, but short girlfriend, much shorter than him. Clint is like 6'2", so he has a normal height. Uh, here's, uh, here's Evan and, my, and, uh, and his daughter, Michelle. But back in the background, my daughter right there. <laughs> this is an old picture. This must have been a, a, a church, it looks like, after after service or after a vacation Bible school from those shirts there. Here are Dan's kids. Um, uh, they are Trent and Autumn who are both little people as well. Um, here's me and Evan. Evan used to kid with me and say, hey, you know, I'm actually taller than you are. We sit down because uh, people with uh, with this type of dwarfism, a chondroplastic dwarfism, their limbs are shorter, but their torsos are, are this not affected. Is Evan taller than I am when we sit up? Hmm, possibly. Sex-linked recessive traits, sex-linked genes. Uh, remember, these are the sex chromosomes with the uh, on the X. I remind you that the Y doesn't carry anything. Um, so uh, this was discovered by Morgan. And again, they did this in the fruit fly. And here are um, some Punnett squares that you can take a look at so that you can review how uh, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the traits are inherited in sex linked traits. Remember the Y doesn't carry anything. So because the Y doesn't carry anything, a male is more likely to have the issue uh, as you see right here, because the, although this X has a recessive characteristic which causes the condition, the male does not have another X with a big R to cancel that out. So um, that is why we have uh, more males with it. Males can't be carriers because they only have one. They either show it or they don't show it. A carrier is a female who doesn't have the condition, but carries the gene for that condition. So again, um, hemophilia and red-green colorblindness are sex-linked recessive traits that I already went over just a little bit. Um, and this we're going to do uh, a little bit later in the genetics problems um, uh, video, so we're going to skip over that for now. Um, but uh, here's a guy with male pattern baldness. Um, remember, I mentioned if your grandpa on your mom's side was bald, then you're going to be bald. Why? Because uh, let's follow that. Grandpa was XY. That means he gave his X with the recessive gene to your mom. And then uh, your dad gave a Y, and your mom gave you an X. 
So you have a chance that your, your mom is going to give you the X with the recessive gene on it. So sex link recessive traits like male pattern baldness are inherited this way. All right, as we finish up, we're gonna take a look at how this all happens in meiosis. Genes are located on chromosomes whose behavior during meiosis and fertilization accounts for Mendel's inheritance patterns. Now we've studied this before, and this is meiosis. As you can see, there's metaphase and anaphase. This is meiosis one right here. Here's meiosis two down here. But the thing is, if you have an accident during meiosis, then the chromosome number can be affected. Now these things down here, asbestos, radiation, ultraviolet light, these are things that can affect whether your chromosome number is changed. Uh, they can affect whether the chromosomes separate correctly during meiosis. So these things down here are called mutagens because they cause mutations and a mutation is a change in the DNA. So with non-disjunction, what it is is you're gonna have an abnormal chromosome count possibly if you have a failure of homologous pairs to separate during meiosis one, like right here. This is not typical. One should go to the right. And so these guys right here are going to have three copies and these guys over here are going to have uh, one copy. So they're going to have the wrong number of chromosomes. Over here, it happens in meiosis too. And you're going to have some that uh, have the normal number, but the other half of them are going to have an abnormal number of chromosomes. So if you take a look at what happens um, in fertilization, when you have an egg and a sperm coming together, and they have too many copies of, of a homo homologous chromosome, and that's where you get three copies like you do right here of this larger one. A common one that you may be aware of is trisomy 21. Trisomy 21 is when you have an extra copy of the 21st chromosome. And so a person with uh, trisomy 21 has, a, has certain physical characteristics that we expect. And so you probably know or have met or uh, uh, have encountered someone with, uh, with Down syndrome. So that is a uh, chromosomal aberration. We have too many copies of chromosome 21. It's more likely to happen if the mother is, <coughs> excuse me, if the mother is, um, is uh, older. And so typically if, you, if the mother is over age 35, um, they'll offer a, a, an amniocentesis. So you can run a carry type to see if, if the fetus has a, uh, has uh, three copies of chromosome 21. Now you can also um, see that uh, you can have an abnormal number of sex chromosomes. Rule of thumb, if you have a Y, you're a male. If you don't have any Ys, you're a female. So let's take a look at it. Here's the first one. This is Turner syndrome. <coughs> and Turner syndrome occurs when you have not 46, but 45 chromosomes. A person with Turner syndrome has these characteristics. They have a short stature, ovarian failure, a web neck and a shield chest. And you can see in the karyotype right here, here is a, there's nothing there, it's missing. So this is a female, she has, a, she has an X. So that's why we're up here it says XO because there's no second chromosome. I know someone with Turner syndrome and uh, she is shorter um, and, uh, and she's able to actually, she can pull the skin up on her neck uh, a few inches, which is uh, one of parties I imagine. So Turner syndrome. Uh, Kleinfelder syndrome is, when, is uh, when you have a male with an extra X chromosome. He's infertile, has some breast tissue development, has some secondary female characteristics, taller than average. The person with Klinefelter syndrome, this is a male, but he has some, uh, some female characteristics as you can see. And I did a lot of text on the slide, but uh, psychologists used to teach us about the super male syndrome. 
which is when a male has two Ys. And if you don't want to read the whole text of this slide, you can see that people with two Ys are typically have lower intelligence. Um, they're over aggressive. It's unusual. And, and you can see that uh, uh, over here that it's less than, it's a very low percentage. Out of 100, or 1,500 carrier types, so you only found one person who was X, Y, Y in a population looks like in the UK. And they're typically taller than usual. Super male syndrome. An abnormal number of sex chromosomes, um, it's uh, certainly something different, but it uh, doesn't usually affect your survival. Um, you can have various uh, degrees of malfunction. Uh, my friend who has Turner syndrome is actually not infertile. She can, she's been told that she can have a baby. So uh, varying degrees of malfunction, you can see that. Uh, instead of having a different number of chromosomes, you could have the same number of chromosomes in your karyotype, but you can have still a problem. Here are four different ways you can have the problem. You can have a part of a chromosome deleted. You can have a part that is duplicated more than once. So that's a deletion and duplication. An inversion happens when uh, you have uh, two adjacent uh, genes that are still there, but they, they flipped. And, <clears throat> and then uh, you also have a situation uh, where you can have that gene, uh, that piece being cut off right there. And then that is going to be swapped out with a piece from a, a chromosome that's a totally different number, a non-homologous chromosome. And that's called the translocation. So careful, even though you have the right number of chromosomes, you may still have an issue. This particular issue, this type of translocation has been shown to um, be the reason for uh, this type of cancer. Um, it is a gene that is activated when this happens called the Philadelphia chromosome. You can see in this old school picture, this one's shorter and this one's longer. And so uh, what happened was a, a piece of uh, the chromosome from chromosome nine was taken and put on the smaller one over here. Uh, that piece right there is taken off and put over here, and that activates that gene, and that gene happens to cause cancer. So that is not what you want. All right, in order to uh, uh, do the quiz correctly this week, I want to remind you of the situation where you have uh, universal donors and recipients. A person who uh, can receive blood from anyone is a person with O-type blood. And a, oh, actually, no, no. To receive from anyone is a person with AB blood. You can see there's no clumping going that way. And a person with O-type blood can give to anyone called universal donor, and their blood can be received safely from any... <clears throat> Um, o can give to any other blood type without the risk of, of uh, clotting. So that's what you see in this diagram. That's just a, a review of something we saw last time, but I know it's on a quiz. All right. Um, so those are some some uh, topics in, in human genetics. And, uh, and so uh, there's all kinds of different topics. This is a very interesting topic. Um, and I remember uh, hearing about all kinds of different things in, in my human genetics class. Um, that's just one lecture, just one short lecture. And it's, so if this is interesting to you, I encourage you to, to seek out more information, do your own searches, take a, take a human genetics course at, when you get to the big U. Um, and, uh, and I hope that I, I piqued your interest a little bit uh, today in the area of human genetics. I'm Mr. Vallejo. Um, thanks for coming to biology class. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.